Good morning. So after this uh, excellent talk so far on uh, space, uh, space and space weather, I thought it would be worthwhile just going through where stuff is. Because to, to a lot of people, space is just up, and it is up, but different types of spacecraft are in different types of orbits doing different sorts of things, and consequently where they are and what they do does change the sensitivity to, to space weather. And also, I'd like to mention a few issues of uh, concern which are boiling up, which will have uh, for us a space weather, space situational awareness component. Now, this nice little picture ripped from Wikipedia <coughs> shows some of the principal orbits which spacecraft are in. They start off close to the Earth, there's LEO, low Earth orbit, then a bit further out there's MEO, medium Earth orbit, and all the way out is GEO, geostationary Earth orbit, and that's kind of roughly to scale. The weird one at the top, HEO, is highly elliptical orbit, and these are sometimes, well, th these are used where stair of the northern hemisphere where most of the civilized nations are is important um, and they're a kind of a special class. Um, space weather comes mainly from the sun, mainly carried a, a, as a whole skein of magnetic fields and complex particle mixtures coming at us in a stream and then they interact with the Earth's magnetic field. Now, the Earth is a wonderful object. It has got a most unusually large uh, magnetic field for, a, space, for a, 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 a planet its size. And it's really the interaction between the s what the sun kicks out and the Earth's magnetic field that produce most of the space weather effects that we see, in particular the ones in orbit. Now, you might have heard of them, the, the, the famous Van Allen belts, radiation belts which are uh, trapped particles in regions around the sun. And that's this is a sort of an expanded picture of them. It's not properly to scale, but it's a pretty one. The outer belt uh, has got mostly electrons in it. The inner belt has got mostly protons in it, a very much higher energy. And in between the outer and inner belts, there's something called the slot region. And the slot region can get very suddenly and densely populated for a reasonably persistent amount of time with the stuff which you've seen coming streaming from the sun. So as a spacecraft operator, which belt am I worried about? Well, let's have a look at some orbit statistics. And this is a nice little graphic. Again, I ripped it from w Wikipedia. And it relates orbital speed and orbital altitude and orbital period in a nice little handy dandy diagram. So let's split it up into bits. First of all, there's the low Earth orbit spacecraft. A low Earth orbit, typically um, they are Earth resources uh, and imagery satellites. A lot of scientific satellites that want to get up and have a taste of space go up there, CubeSats and such like. You can get up there with a small launcher and even better, once you've launched it, so long as you're below 700 kilometers, it kind of disposes of itself neatly by getting into the Earth's atmosphere and returning to the Earth, either as a shower of sparkly bits or as a small lumps. So to put that into a kind of a scale perspective, there's an example of where we are. Um, Earth's surface is obviously at zero kilometers. And typically, the orbital period is anywhere between about 90 minutes and two hours. And look at the speed of these uh, things. When they are in orbit, they're traveling at something like seven kilometers per second. Now, seven kilometers per second is a kind of a difficult um, number to imagine, especially if you're used to commuting in southwest trains. But just to put it in perspective, a little bit, a, 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 a bit of glitter from a Christmas card traveling at seven kilometers a second packs about the same punch as two hand grenades. So if you get hit by that and you're a spacecraft, it's good night. So you have to be very careful. Um, I've also slotted in there, you can just about see it, mega constellations. This is the new thing that's happening. And they don't, don't, they kind of elude classification really because they can be quite low and they can be up to 8,000 kilometers, but I'll talk, to, talk about them specifically in a bit. Going back to um, LEO spacecraft, um, 
if you're at 400 kilometers, which is above 200 kilometers, which a lot of people think is about the beginnings of space, you are going to get orbital drag. So the atmosphere does have a density. It will slow your satellite down. And there's two charts there. Blue is solar minimum density, which is kind of what we're at just now. The sun's not generally making the atmosphere, upper atmosphere very hot. It's not going particularly high. The spacecraft doesn't get a lot of, of aerodynamic drag, and therefore its life in orbit can be quite extended. However, if we're at a period of high solar activity, the upper atmosphere of the sun, uh, upper, upper, upper atmosphere of the Earth is uh, quite warmed. It extends higher and it's thicker, and it will grab your spacecraft and pull it down to Earth a lot faster. So let's take another case. Let's say you're at maybe ooh, just short of 600 kilometers up, which is a very typical altitude for something which is called a sun-synchronous spacecraft. These are used for um, Earth resources observation. Uh, so they've got big, expensive telescopes on board. You want to keep them alive a bit, so <coughs> alive for some time. So what you do is you launch them with fuel on board so you can give them boosts in orbital altitude. So what the drag takes away, you give it a boost, kick the spacecraft up again, and dependent on where you are in the solar cycle depends upon how much boosting you have to give your satellite in order to keep it up uh, so that it doesn't decay in orbit and burn up. But the sun can be very capricious. Now, we've talked about uh, solar storms. Here's a... A, a solar storm that happened in 1989. Now, okay, this is a fair length of time ago, but it is a good illustrative example. And what happened here was that the Earth's atmosphere expanded, it grabbed a lot of low Earth orbiting satellites, and then suddenly the satellites weren't where people thought they were supposed to be. Now, this is important for this space situational awareness because, I've said, as I've said, you do not want spacecraft clumping into each other because it creates a cloud of debris and little, little bits of debris can cause an awful lot of damage. Some of you might have heard of something called the Kessler Syndrome. Now, this was proposed by a, an American uh, space physicist called Donald Kessler. And he was concerned that what with uh, mankind putting so many objects into space, eventually you'd wind up with collision followed by collision followed by collision and it all exponentiating until the Earth was surrounded by a shell of debris and mankind could never leave the planet Earth because it would get killed on the way up. Now, there's all sorts of interesting studies being made on that. But lost satellites is, are a feature if you're applying a low Earth orbit spacecraft. And one of the products which a spacecraft operator using a, uh, or operating a LEO spacecraft are good fo weather forecasts, if you like, space weather forecasts, for when and where and when the upper atmosphere is getting hot and is going to give them drag and alter the spacecraft's orbit. Another thing which low Earth orbit has to deal with is the fact that not only is the Earth very beautiful, it's also very squint and bent inside. The magnetic field of the Earth acts as though the dipole's got a big offset on it. That means the inner radiation belt, the inner Van Allen belt, which has got protons in it, comes really quite close to their surface, and actually it nearly touches, uh, well, it gets almost to airline heights. So you can have very, very high energy protons getting very close to their surface, and certainly if you're at an altitude of 500 kilometers, you're going to go into what's called the South Atlantic Anomaly. That's not the same as the Bermuda Triangle, but it's kind of the same thing. And many, many spacecraft anomalies in LEO are associated directly with flying through this particular region where this inner belt is nearly touching the Earth. Okay, let's move a little bit further out. MEO. MEO orbits are typically used by your GPS, GNSS systems. To get there, you need a much larger launcher. I've just illustrated there where these mega constellations are in this picture as well. Not quite up to the same level as MEO, but almost. Typically, these uh, GNSS satellites have an orbital period of about 12 hours. They're going a bit slower, um, but, uh, but their orbit therefore takes them through uh, 
the outer layer of the Van Allen belts, the protons, an awful lot. Now, this is known. We know that the, um, the uh, environment there is particularly aggressive. So these spacecraft are built with shielding and they're built with nice big fat transistors and the right sort of doping in the transistors so that they can cope with protons. They're built with the capacity to deal with memory corruptions at a far higher level because that's n where, well, that's the, the, the territory they're in. About these mega constellations, now this is something that I took from um, Space News. What they are talking about is putting sp uh, spacecraft up in the order of their thousands at an altitude of about 1,200 kilometers, uh, 1,100 kilometers. That's one web and SpaceX. One web, they are about to produce or start producing, uh, mass producing these spacecraft. The uh, plant in Toulouse, which has done the initial build of them, has spat out the first 100. They're going to be put onto a launcher, and the launcher's going to launch 36 of these spacecraft at a time to populate this outer shell. Now, think about it. The Kessler syndrome is rather uh, a worry at this stage. You do not want to have two of these spacecraft bashing into each other and producing a whole shower of debris. Um, in order to, uh, to do that, you have to be able to manoeuvre your spacecraft. To be able to manoeuvre your spacecraft, you need to, to know where it is, and you need to be able to command it. And again, space weather is really rather important because if you are impeded in commanding your spacecraft or you lose command of it at a, a, at a critical time when you ought to be doing a manoeuvre, then you are running the risk of a collision. Now, there's all sorts of fancy maths being done about what the risk of collision actually is, and I do hope the maths is correct. Okay, then this is now we're into uh, more familiar territory for me. This is geostationary orbit. So geostationary orbit is this very, very particular, 36,786 kilometers up. If you're at that particular orbit and you're in a circular orbit, it means that the orbital period is 24 hours, exactly the same as the rotation rate of the Earth, so that your satellite dish giving you Sky TV can say safely bolted to the side of your house pointing in the same direction all the time. That's one of the beauties of it. Um, to get to GEO, you do need a really big, powerful launcher. And also, you have become constrained in that your launch site has to be quite close to the equator. Because otherwise, if you're trying to launch it from the pole, it would take an awful lot of energy to do the plane change of the orbits uh, inclination in order to get it above the equator. So who's out there? Communication satellites and weather satellites are out there looking at the normal wet weather of the Earth. So in summary, there's a little picture. We've got these belts for trapped radiation around the Earth. We've got the GPS satellites, which are always hammering their way through uh, the radiation belts. And we've got the geosatellites, which turns out to be almost always on the very outer fringes of the electron belts. But if you recall uh, Lucy's picture of the uh, magnetic field that of the Earth battered around like a windsock from the solar wind, sometimes we're in it, sometimes we're out of it, sometimes the population of that uh, outer belt is much higher than normal, and that is what kind of induces space weather effects in terms of electrical failures on board spacecraft. Right, here's a nice little uh, picture, set of pictures. These are uh, the known tracks of objects of 10 centimeters in size or bigger. You, you can see the geo, uh, sorry, the, 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 the uh, low Earth orbiters all around the, uh, the Earth. If you are, and then you can see the outer shell of the uh, NEO uh, comsats. And then the outer ring uh, was the geostationary belt. Sometimes you can see the uh, particular orbits of the uh, Sun synchronous spacecraft as they go around. Um, I can tell you it's a busy place. However, that's not really to scare you too much. Space is big, and the chances of an impact are quite small. However, if you don't manage that 
risk, then you're being extremely responsible, which is why you need to be able to range, and why, why you need to be able to, to, to maneuver your spacecraft to avoid collisions. And that's what's called space situational awareness. Nice little uh, picture which I got from your website. Um, just trying to put it in context again. So if nothing else, if you've, uh, if you've learned nothing else, there's a difference between Mio, Leo, and Geo, and they're all affected by different sorts of particles, and these particles' uh, mixtures all change depending on the space weather that's happening. I have to say that it's really difficult to envisage this whole stuff. You've got the particles from the sun, you've got the flares from the sun, your spacecraft gets affected, and then you've got the ionosphere. Don't, please don't consider going near the ionosphere. It's horrible. Trying to understand the maths of that is dreadful. But it has to be part of my concern because all of the signals which I have to transmit have to go through it. And sometimes it goes opaque and sometimes it goes noisy. And all of that's down to the sun when the sun flares and produces X-ray and ultraviolet, which causes excitement of the upper layers. It either stops the layers you want to deflect uh, radio, like your HF communications deflecting, or make it go opaque just at the moment you want to command your spacecraft. I did mention the uh, Kessler syndrome, and I did find this nice little chart. So uh, the top red line is, uh, uh, is your Leo spacecraft, then you've got your uh, Mio spacecraft, and then the green line at the bottom is Geo. And what NASA did was, well, it's 2009, and they thought, right, let's have a look at spacecraft and imagine that we launched no more and just took our hands off the controls and did nothing in terms of collision avoidance. What possible debris el evolution could happen from that? Well, first thing to point out is that sudden up kink uh, at just before 2009, which promoted this study into the Kessler effect, and uh, that's due to CubeSats beginning to get launched. There are now even more CubeSats than that, and not shown in this chart, of course, are the mega constellations which are going to get launched as well. Um, the reason that uh, the red line shows a bit of a decrease in orbital debris is, of course, if you have two um, Leo spacecraft collide, a lot of the debris will wind up in Earth's atmosphere anyway and burn up. But you can see it all can possibly ex exponentiate if you don't look after your spacecraft and have deorbiting and avoidance uh, capabilities. The other thing which is interesting from our point of view is that the spacecraft industry is changing quite drastically from going uh, from chemical propulsion to electric propulsion. Now, the real reason for this is mass. Instead of launching two and a half tons of propellant in a geo spacecraft, you can get away with 700 kilograms of xenon, which is great. So smaller launchers, much more cheap, Smaller launchers or smaller satellites means that you get much more payload for your launch. So more, cust more customers are serviced and happy. The problem with uh, electric orbit raising is that it happens in many, many stages over many, many months. And as this diagram shows, which I make from our competitors, Utilsat, you spend quite a lot of time circulating through this slot region, which I've said can suddenly get populated with very high energy electrons. So how well or how fit is your spacecraft going to be in terms of radiation exposure after it's been gone through its period of electric orbit raising? Well, it all depends upon what the sun does to it. Again, this is where space weather forecasting could be very important to operations, not just in the day-to-day -day lifetime of the spacecraft, but in terms of the management of the service provision that follows. So when you're doing space operations, there's lots of things impact uh, that result as impacts from space weather. As I've said, you can get scintillation of the ionosphere, you can get degradation of GNSS services that, pr that, uh, that may provide you with the navigation and timing. Quite a, number, uh, quite a number of spacecraft actually do use GPS receivers as part of their orbit determination. In terms of controlling, manage, uh, managing, and maintaining your spacecraft, you could get interruption to your telemetry tracking and control signals. You do get spacecraft damage over time. 
uh, that's a natural degradation, but it can have steps in it due to what the space weather throws at you. And you do get more uh, onboard memory corruptions and spurious switching if there are big proton events. In terms of the ground segment, and people sometimes think, well, the ground, that's not space. But without the ground, we wouldn't be able to look after what's up in space. Potential interruption to power is a worry. Terrestrial data lines from satellite ground stations to control stations are actually all fiber optic. And you think, well, that's not electrical. But uh, they are, because every 17 kilometers or so, they are, have got a repeater station. So if you lose power, then your fiber goes dark, which means you lose control, you lose your comms, and happy customers. Um, and that means that, at least for, uh, in, in our domain, because there is a the, the space weather might have the potential to cause us uh, problems at a satellite ground station and maybe knock one out, we have to consider where people are during space weather events. So we've got the right types of engineers, the right kind of operators at the correct locations to deal with a system which has gone suboptimal because of space weather. So just a little chart which kind of sums up all that I've said. You have solar events which give you increased radiation. In order to deal with that, you have to do defensive investments and design and engineering to make your whole system good, not just the spacecraft. The magnetosphere gets affected and that winds up um, causing problems with your, your ionosphere. You have link disruptions which affect all classes of spacecraft. Particulate radiation, that's your protons and electrons, give you dosage, which is basically wearing out the spacecraft. Single event effects, which is computer interruptions. Spacecraft charging, which causes things to fuse, which wind up being anomalies. And you can lose your satellite. And of course, if you're really close to the ground, the hotter the atmosphere, the shorter your life. And that's it. Thanks very much.